meanings within the same context, within the same context though. So that's what it is. But what they what com they commonly you read on the internet is that they give you an impression that they are actually conflicting. Where I've explained that to you, I think quite well. Now the other thing is the modes of recitals. So for example, if you were to ask someone to sing a song in just say someone in Wales, Northern Wales, will sing the song compared to someone in, um, uh, just say, Essex. The dialects are different. Yes, the recitals will sound different. There used to be, I'll tell you something, you know, back in the day, I, I used to enjoy watching football, there used to be a very famous Scottish football player called Kenny Dalgleish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Liverpool. People used to say, right, when he used to give his um, half time team talk, yeah. They, they could, and they were English English speakers. Yeah. They couldn't understand what he was saying it's, yeah, it's because his Scottish it's accent has such a twang, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> right? So this is what you call modes of saying something, modes of the same thing. So it would be modes of recital. Yeah. Are you are you finding what I'm saying to you? Yeah, yeah, so that's it. It's not different in versions, whereas the Bible yeah. differs in its very fundamental, different, contradictory verses. Like, let me let me can I just give an example? Yeah. yeah? In, um, in English speaking people here yeah, in this country, we say tomato or tomato. Other countries we say tomato or tomato. The spelling is still the same, yeah? but they pronounce it differently. You understand? You've got potato and potato. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this is uh, some of the analogies that I can give you, yeah, like you know, from a you know, from a little like in a perspective, like people have different ways of saying things. Do you understand? Or even it's the same word. Do you understand? Yeah. So that's what that's what it is. So in, in the Quran we have Maliki Yomuddin. Do you know what I found out the other day? You know, the, you know, I don't know Arabic. Yeah, but that's one. But this, the wording is still the same, but they pronounce it a little bit different. So the word is different. But say, Malik. For example, yeah, Malik and Malik. What does it mean? Malik? Uh, uh, one is the owner of the uh, the owner of the judgment. The other one is the king of the uh, uh, king of the. Uh, it's main same thing though. So for example. So if one last the brother said one it says king of the day of judgment yeah. one owner yeah, same owner. thing mean you're the master who will preside over it yeah. <laughs> now but the spelling everything's the same now for example the, you know i only found out some time ago you know the english word root yeah. when you go on the route to somewhere yeah like uh, uh, r o u t e uh, yeah. like road route. yeah Is yeah route yeah. when you go on the route you know how the americans pronounce it Route. Route. <laughs> there you go. But the spelling is still the same. Yeah, yeah spelling is the same, but so the mode is different. The, the mode is different of the way they say that's it. So but, where, but whereas the Bible, on the other hand, they've got massive internal versions which differ from gospel to gospel. Different yeah. words rearranged, taken out of its context, contradicting one another. If you were to show a Quranic verse, that intrinsically by nature contradicts itself, okay. then that would be something different. But if you're having different words, as yeah. then that's a different thing. So I think you explained that very well. Yeah. I have one more question. Yes, my brother. I've heard that in Islam, yes. like in Christianity, you believe in Jesus. Or in Islam. We believe in the Muslim okay. message. Yeah. But I've heard, uh, I go to speakers' corners sometimes, yes. and I hear some people talking yeah. and I look on the internet. Yeah. I've heard that Muslims don't believe Jesus was crucified. So who was crucified? What, what do you believe? No. So, go, go. Yeah. So, Muslims, yeah, Muslims say that in, in the Quran, Allah says in Surah 4, verse 157, that the Jews boasted, we killed Christ, the son of Mary. Look what it's specifically saying. That the Jews boasted, we killed Christ, the son of Mary. Allah says, neither did they crucify him, nor did they kill him. But so it was made to appear to them. For a surety they, they killed him not, no, Allah raised him up to him up to himself. Okay, so who was crucified? So, good point. So, according to the various traditions, because there was some Christian history. Sorry, just a minute. Sorry, there was a man on the cross. Right. So, so it wasn't Jesus. So who was the man? Okay. So what we say is that it was made to appear to them. Now, for example, if you read the gospel accounts in Mark's gospel, it says all the disciples forsook and fled. Okay, all of them. His female disciples, listen carefully, it's very important. Okay. If you've asked a specific question, I need yeah. to give a precise response. Okay. The female disciples in Mark's gospel were watching from far away. Yeah. And it was dark. 
So it begs the question, if they're watching from far away and it was dark, how do they know it was Jesus on the cross? They can't know. They can't. See, can't see properly. So what's your name? Jonathan. Mine's Mustafa. Nice All to meet you, Jonathan. Nice Jonathan. But if you read John's account... I haven't read it, but... Just compare and contrast. Right. John was written about 100 AD. Okay. Mark was written 70 AD, so a yeah. 30 year gap, roughly. So, in John's account of the same incident, what does he have? He has those same female disciples standing right at the cross where Jesus was crucified. Oh, I didn't know that. I'll explain to you in a minute what I'm, co what I'm coming to. Okay. That's one example. So, Mark's account, they're watching from far away. It's dark. And in John's there next to the cross. In John did right next to the cross. Store that in your mind. In Mark's account, we have Simon taking the cross all the way to Gethsemane. So all the way to Golgotha where the crucifixion takes place. So he's carrying the whole cross all the way. It never shows at any point that the cross was then handed over to Jesus. Right. But don't worry, John to the rescue. In John's account, Jesus carries the cross all the way through the streets to yeah. Golgotha. Two points to store away. Third point. Mark, Matthew, Luke, they don't mention the spearing in the side, yeah. which where the blood got yeah, yeah, forth. Yeah. But hey presto, it's mentioned in John's Gospel. Okay. Second, that's, that's third point. All right. Fourth point. In Mark's account, he says, so God, take this burden of cup away from me. For it's not for this purpose that I've come. In John's Gospel, what does he say? He, he basically says, I'm just paraphrasing it. it. Is it for this purpose? It's for this very purpose that I have come. So Mark's account, take this burden of cup away from me. But in John's account, he says, no, it's for this very purpose that I've come to be crucified. Conflict, conflict there, you see. Mark's account, he wants to, he wants to be t it taken away from him, this burden. But in John's account, he says, no, it's for this very purpose that I've come. This is a fourth, I don't want to inundate you. So, what have we, so what's the reason, what's the point of me giving these four examples? An evolution, Jonathan, is taking place. Okay. Why is an evolution taking place? Because later Christians, who, at the time of God, at the time of John, they were the Basilidians. Have you heard of them? Groups of. So you need to know your Christian history well. Post the ascension of Jesus, there were very, there were varying different Christian communities, all believing different things. I've heard that, but I don't know the name that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So you can check that on the internet. Basilidians. Basilidians. Yeah. There were also the Colodicians as well, but let's just stick with one at a time. There were the Basilidians. They believed Christ wasn't crucified. And they were a substantial group within Christianity. Okay. Now, yeah. Now, when John is writing his gospel, because he's portraying Jonathan the particular theology, he wants to go over and beyond to hammer that theology home. That Christ died for your sins in accordance with what Paul wrote. Yeah. So what he's doing is he's trying to then lay to rest these claims from these Christians according to what he understood. So hence, these four examples I've given you, he, he embellishes them. To leave you in no doubt whatsoever, Christ was crucified. Because from those, yes. Have you understood the point I'm making? I so, so for Mark, for... for to back their view. Yeah. Yes, yes. And you can see how it's happened. Okay. I've given you four examples yeah, of yeah, that. Yeah. And there are many other examples I can cite, but that's going to be information overload. But those, that will show to you that John is deliberating He's embellishing those accounts to then perpetuate his claim. Furthermore, in John's Gospel, about Christ's persona, it's not a question you've asked, but I'll elaborate on it. In John's account, uh, yes, if you're, if you're not happy with it, we can, oh, we can blurt, okay. but just sorry, we should have asked. It's fine. But if you're not happy, just, but I'm giving you the option, Jonathan, you, you said it's fine, so we'll accept, we'll accept that. But if you're not happy, we can blur you out as well. We've got to consider no, it. Fantastic. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Fantastic. So in John's account of the same incident. So in John, sorry, I beg your pardon, I was going to say something. In John, what do we observe? We observe that from Mark's account, he speaks much about the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Him being a human prophet. 
you see he's limited in many capacities. Where the where the lady where the young lady touches him. Okay. And you know, and he, he looks around and says, Oh, yeah. who has touched me? Because he felt the power yeah. coming out of him. But don't worry, how you press like John to the rescue, he already knows who's touched him by saying, Blessed are you. Okay? Now so it appears that in Mark he's limited. Matthew covers up some of those limitations and then John takes it a step further by adding these self-proclamatory I am statements. The Father and I are one. Before Abraham was I am. He that has seen me has seen the Father. All this elevated, this is called the I am statement. So you don't find them in the earlier Gospels. It's a bit bizarre. These very important statements which you would find in John's Gospel, they don't pop, they're, they're, not, in, they're, not, they're not in Mark's Gospel. So Christian scholars, Jonathan, have come to the conclusion that, John, uh, that um, John's Gospel, which is, as you know, not referred to the Synoptic Gospels, meaning seen through the, uh, through the lenses of the respective um, 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 uh, uh, authors. Now, John's Gospel is commonly referred to as a figurative, metaphorical, allegorical, unhistorical Gospel. Because of these such examples that it's impossible to believe that such elevated statements you get in John don't prop up in the synoptics. Are you trying to tell us these very important statements that Christ is making of himself, the synoptic don't even mention them? Does that make any sense? Just say for example, we have, me and you have a conversation today. Yeah. Jonathan, you tell me something very important about yourself. Okay. Just say you give me two really important pieces of information. Yeah. And then you tell me something tertiary, third information, which is minor. Am I, gonna, am, I, am I going to put down, am I going to forget to mention the two major points of information that you've given me and just add the inconsequential third point? No. So therefore, colleagues have concluded, how can it possible that John would attribute all these statements to Christ? So they've concluded the following. John's Gospel went through five stages of redaction. Editing. There were editing. Oh, editing. Yeah, editing. So, for example, when they wrote it, they would then draft it again and again and again, and that's what you call redaction or editing. So, and there and there were three by by conservative estimates, there were three different authors of John's Gospel. It wasn't commonly, as Christians mistakenly understand, written by John the um, John the disciple. It was written by anonymous authors. That's comprehensive. Across the board, all Christian scholars say that the Gospels were written by anonymous authors. We don't know who wrote them. They attribute it to this individual, but we don't know. Now, when we go to John in particular, why am I mentioning John? It's because these self proclamatory statements, what's happened is one of the authors is, is genuine. The other author decides to embellish and the third author just outright makes out statements attributed to Christ that he doesn't make because he thinks this is what Christ ought, ought to have said and we will encompass that on his lips as if he said it. So for example John 1.1, 1, 1, these are not the words of Christ, these are referred to as a prologue to John's Gospel, a parenthesis. Now why did that come about? Why did the author thought that necessary to put in that John 1.1? 1, 1? It's because there was a very famous um, historian by the name of Philo of Alexandria who lived about a generation or two before Jesus. He was referred to as a Hellenistic Jew. You know, you know about this, these terms, do you? Hellenistic Greek. Yeah, so Hellenists were Jews who lived outside of Palestine in the Greco-Roman diaspora. Okay. So Hellenism was like a, a watered-down version of, 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 um, of, of the teachings that the children of Israel had manifest in from them from them for, so what it did then it watered, it watered down the, and, and encompassed the greco-roman understandings of who god was so i'll give you an example john John. i hope you don't want me calling you john so basically speaking jonathan the term son of god yeah crucial and critical to understand this point in the in in, in the language of the of the children of israel it would be simply referred to as one who represents God, carrying no divine connotation whatsoever. It's defined in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, which says the following, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Okay. So, uh, so the title, Son of God, was ubiquitous to those who represent God. Oh, okay. In, Mark, in Luke chapter 3, verse 38, 
Adam is referred to as the son of God. Yeah. And David, is David, referred David is referred to. I've heard that. Yeah. Yes, many people are. It's defined, but the definition is there. Yeah. But that doesn't mean he's yeah. God himself. Right? Exactly. I get you. But yeah, in I the see. Greek or Roman world, the same term yeah. would carry a title of like a demigod, whereby people who were referred with the title son of God were like agents who lived in the heavens who would come down to the earth procreate with women and they would be referred to as sons of God oh, okay. so their definition was like a demigod type figure a Hercules. precisely Hercules or Augustus Caesar who would be given these types of honorific titles where they'd be deemed as semi-gods when they, when they were as we know just humans but because they were deemed in such exalted manner, they were given. So we see the difference there. This is what you call the Hellenistic influence, which incorporated itself in the Greek or Roman world. Because we know the New Testament was written in Greek, and hence this prevailed. These these terms prevailed. So John's Gospel, in particular, why am I speaking about that relentlessly? Because it elevates Christ. But even John does not equate Christ as the Almighty God. Okay. If you read all these verses in context, like John. That like many Christians would use John 10 30 as evidence of Christ's divinity, where he makes the claim the Father and I are one. Yeah. Jonathan, it's absolutely bizarre and to the point ridiculous as to why this conclusion is made. Because all you've got to do is apply the context within, within the verses okay. to say that what does he mean when he says the Father and I are one? Yeah. Does he mean he's claiming to be the Almighty God? Yeah. No, he doesn't. The preceding verses tell us. You're a Christian, of course, aren't you? No. But you seem to know the Bible pretty well. I was went to a Christian school when I was small. But I, see. I don't practice. Have you, been, have you been born and brought up here? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Morning, yeah. So, for example, morning, the bizarre. Right. Na see, we're in the age now, um, Jonathan, of technology, where information is freely at hand. So this Trinity concept is now becoming absolutely, you know, refuted to the point that it's no longer valid. So what did he mean when he said, "I am the Father"? No, no. When he said, "The Father and I are one," he didn't say, "I'm the Father." Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. What he meant is, you've got to read the verse in its context. Excuse me, I'm a little bit out of breath because I'm fasting. Oh, and you know what? You know, Siri, time I don't eat anything. Oh, okay. I have a half a glass of water. It's gonna be a few seconds just to get my breath back. Is that for me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Okay. So basically speaking, in John chapter 10, verse 23, Jesus is walking in the temple of the colonnade of Solomon. Okay. The Jews surround him, yeah. who are his enemies, yeah. and they say to him, if you are indeed the Messiah, tell us plainly. There is no other way. Jesus says to him, I've already told you so, yet you are not my sheep. Okay. Meaning you don't want to follow me. Those who are my sheep, they follow what I have to say. Yeah. For God who has sent me and sanctified me, for the Father is greater than all. So in the context of what we're observing so far, Jonathan, he's telling them, you blokes, you don't want to follow me, you're not my sheep. I've already told you I'm the Messiah. He didn't say, I've already told you I'm God. Yeah. He just said, I'm the Messiah, which is not God. Yeah, yeah. Because by definition, God is the one who is supposedly anointing the Messiah. So he can't be the Messiah, he's not anointing himself. Yeah. Okay? So in that verse, then, he further says that that it's God who has sanctified and sent me, for the Father is greater than all. Then he says, for I give eternal life. And Christians say, well, he gives eternal life, it must be God. No, because it's an authority which has been given to him in the following verse. It's an authority that has been given. And what does he mean by I give you eternal life? Is that if you follow my way, you will succeed in the hereafter. You will follow, you will succeed in the hereafter by following my commandments. As ordained, because God has given him the authority as one who represents God. So hence, when he says this particular term, he's trying to tell them in effect, when he makes the utterance, the Father and I are one, that we're one in purpose, of bringing you, you people who have gone away from worshipping God, back to worshipping God. And I'm the conduit in which that will happen. Okay, like I'm like, yeah. Yeah, precisely. Christ never claims that he's the destination. He's the way to God. So for example, you have to follow him. It becomes incumbent upon those to whom he came to, to, follow him because he's a set example just like it's incumbent upon the pre upon the previous generations to follow those prophets who came to them they had to go through them there was no other option they had to go through Moses the children of Israel they had to go through Solomon David um, Joseph and whoever the case may be are you finding what I'm saying so when then he says the father and I are one he means it in this context the Greek word is called hen for one 
Same Greek word is used in John 17, 20 to 23, when he says to the disciples, as you can become one with us, and we can become one together. It, so is he trying to say we, you can become God with me? No. One in the purpose of bringing you guys back to worshipping God. And the same Greek word, hen, is used in John chapter 17, verse 20 to, 20 to 23. Out of interest for you, in Mark 12, 28, where Jesus said, where the rabbi asked Jesus, so the, the, the scribe asked Jesus, what is the greatest of all commandments? He says to him, Hear thou, O Israel, your Lord God, the Lord is one. Same word, one, English word. But interestingly, the word there for one is haste. Haste is primary meaning is the cardinal one, meaning the same one in essence, one in total. So it's interesting that in John 10 30 he uses the term hen and in John 17 20 23 same hen which is what one in purpose so that is the context I'll go on further that like they pick up stones to stone him so commonly Christians say well they're picking up stones to stone him because he claimed to be God that's what they're claiming. but what does he say note something this is very important obviously you seem to have read the Bible well because you're following everything I'm saying so between the father and I are one they pick up stones to stone him. The Christians are claiming the reason why they're doing that is because he's made a blasphemous statement and hence he must be God. But don't you think it's somewhat odd that when they're picking up st stones to stone him and if Jesus did mean what he said by saying the Father and I are one is claiming to be God, it's a bit bizarre when they pick up stones to stone him that he should say to them, for which of my good works do you cast stones at me? So at that point, he's oblivious as to why they're picking up the stones to stone him. But he would not have been oblivious, he would not have said that had he known, had he meant that he was God, because he would have known the reason why they're picking up stones is because I made a statement that I'm God. But rather than that, he says, it's not for... So this is, he responds by simply saying, that for which of my good works? So he's confused, he's thinking, I've done all these works. And then they say to him mischievously, Jonathan, in verse 33, it's not for good works that we cast stones at you, but for you, a man claiming to be God. At this point now, Christ has realized what they actually have done. They've tried to infer that when he said the Father and I are one, he's claiming to be God. So initially he's confused, that's why he says, for which of my good works do you cast stones at me? So that shows he never meant to claim to be God. When they mischievously say to him, no, it's not for good work, but you claiming to be God, then he silences them further by telling them, is it not written in your previous scriptures that you are gods? So he's trying to tell them in your scriptures it's written that those, those who do God's work are referred to as gods. Psalm 82 6, which is it says in there in Psalm 82 6, where God is presiding over his court. And you have you have judges, angels who are referred to as sons of God and prophets. So he says, in that context, if I'm referring to myself as a son of God, what's your issue? I'm not claiming to be God, but one who is within that context, one who is one who represents God. So he then, then when you go back to the gospel again of that same account, so he basically says to them, and I'm paraphrasing it from the top of my head, he says, so then if I have said I am the son of God, he's basically saying, what's your issue? Because those who do God's work are given this title. So what they're trying to do mischievously, you see, Jonathan, in John, in John chapter 8 verse 40, where Christ says that I am a man who has been sent to you, yet you are determined to kill me. Look, what he, a man being sent to you. Yeah. So why, how are they determined to kill him? Because they ha don't have the validation themselves to kill him. They have to make up a concrete reason to give reasoning to the Roman authorities to do away with Jesus to crucify they can say listen according to our law he's claiming to be God so you by definition cannot stop us then crucify him because this is a blasphemy so the Jews so the Romans then would have to accede to the demands of the Jews however he makes no such claim you see but they're trying their best to do away with him and hence they're making up these divine claims against him that he's not making giving them hence a pretext to appeal to the Romans to do away with him but because they don't have the evidence that he's made the claim in Mark 14 61 they then lower the claim when he appears before the Sanhedrin 
in the court. And they say, sorry, and they said, if you, are you the Christ, the Messiah? He says, I am. No, they don't say, are you claiming to be God? But the actual trial happens because they realize at the end of the day, there's no witnesses to what they're saying. The witnesses have been washed away. There's no witnesses to anything that is claimed to be God. So in front of the court, the Sanhedrin asks him, are you the Messiah? So the accusation has been watered down. Are you finding what I'm saying to you? Because they cannot crucify the crucifixion, crucifying someone. Can, and it's only, you know something, Jonathan? There are famous New Testament, there are famous um, historians, which I'm not sure if you're aware of, named Flavius Josephus. I've heard of that. He wrote the history of the Jews. Well done, you know your man, your clued on guy. He wrote the Antiquity, Antiquities oh, of the Deeds. Antiquities? Okay. Yes. Also, another very famous historian called Tacitus. I've heard Roman. Like, man, yeah. you know your stuff very nice. I'm very glad to speak to you. So basically speaking, these were early historians. Yeah. So Christians say there's evidence outside of the Gospels which shows that uh, Jesus was crucified and died for the sins. Yeah. But these historians, when they question those people who heard by hearsay that Jesus was crucified, well, it matches the Quran that they thought that they killed him. So it was only hearsay. So when Flavius Josephus interviews people who heard by hearsay a generation later that there was a sage called Jesus who came to Galilee who, who preached good works and he apparently died but that's only hearsay evidence because they were not, none of these were witnesses okay. that's what the Quran says they only have conjecture to follow but for a surety God saved him because by definition Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 one who dies is a curse if you're, if you're a prophet and you die you're a curse. So Jesus, according to the definition, is a curse because he takes on the sins and dies for us. I mean, that's not what is the actual definition of what God does, you see. It becomes a curse onto us. Jesus, let me finish up. So Jesus becomes a curse onto us, whereas in Islam, he's deemed as one who is close to God and loved by God. Not this nonsense of taking on the curse. So, to wrap things up, what we're observing, hints, my friend, is that the Gospels are trying to portray, the later Gospels are trying to elevate Christ's status but at no stage are even they making claims that he's the almighty God. Even in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I like to recite, I like to cite this very, very much, where Paul says, for unto us there is one God the Father from whom all things come and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things come. So he's even distinguishing, if you notice the terms. God the Father is from whom all things come. Jesus Christ the Lord is through. So through is a passive conduit. What does that mean through? If God makes the creation from, from God, Christ is that passive, silent through. And that could often be referred to in, in Christ's name, God created creation, coming through him. So it's not that Christ is like getting a hammer and fixing the stars here and or fixing the constellations there. What he's doing is he's the passive conduit through. Meaning in, in Christ's name does God make everything. 2 Philippians 5 to 11. At the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the Lord but to the glory of God the Father. So you will not bow, you will not take that bow to Jesus. It's in his name that the bowing will occur, but the bowing will occur to God the Father. It's shocking how they don't read the verse in his context. So it's in his name that every knee shall bow, but not to him. So it will be like a, 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 a hymn to inculcating the importance of Christ, but the glory is through God to God. The actual Word, the actual bowing is to God. So 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul says there are many gods and many lords. So for those people who worship or who are false gods and who are false lords, who are those false lords? People who are exalted up high. So when Paul says, for unto us there is one God the Father. So he's distributing God as the Father, as the only God for, the, for, for us and one Lord Jesus Christ, meaning amongst those many false lords, before, there are, for us there is only one Lord, the exalted Jesus, the human Jesus Christ. Are you following what I'm saying to you? 
So even Paul is defining that Christ is separated as a Lord because he breaks up the Shema from Deuteronomy 6.4 where it says, Hear thou, O Israel, your Lord God, the Lord is one. So what he does, he makes God as the only true God, but Jesus is given the title of Lord amongst those many male lords. But for us, there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ, who is the male Lord, the human Lord. Make sense? So even Paul is distinguishing between the two. Paul, when he makes the title of Lord, it's a title of honor for Jesus Christ, as you earlier noted as well. Um, you know, like you get the, Lord, the, the House of Lords or the Lord of the House in Mark's Gospel. Um, or Ab uh, Sarah referring to Abraham as her Lord. So even Paul, who was never, who never ever referred to Jesus as God. This is a mistake many people make. Even Muslims make this mistake. They jump on the bandwagon and think, Paul, yep, he, he preached that Jesus was God. No, he never. He preached that Jesus was Elio. It was like a massive, um, massive type of elevation of Christ. But, you know, so Christians can get confused. They'll say, look, everything's made through him. He might, therefore, he must be God because he's the maker. But no, read the verses carefully. Um, God is the one that who's do, everything is, is, the, is the maker. He's the one from whom all things come. These are key words, from and through, very distinguishable. When something is coming from someone, that means he's the creator. When something goes through someone, he's not one, the source. So Christ would be coming through him would be the, the conduit. Making all sense, isn't it? Through his name, God does all, all everything. That's it in a nutshell. What do you think? So we as Muslims say what? We as Muslims say, let's cut no, the chase. He's, uh, he's interested in Islam as well. Yeah, that's what I want to get to. Yeah, yeah, so so yeah. Islam. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Jonathan, in Islam, we give soul glory to God alone. The Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace. Just God's messenger, no more, no less. Listen to this, last point, then you can take over. John 17, 3, the creme de la month of all the verses. For this is eternal life, meaning how to get the hereafter, that they may know you as the only true God and whom you have sent, the apostelos, the messenger Jesus Christ. Digest that. He, this is what we say he is. Bro, let me hear this. This is what he, we say he is, a messenger sent by Jesus Christ. The Greek word, if you go to biblehub.net, the Greek interlinear of John 17, 3. Just, just click on the, the number above. It says a messenger sent by God is the word apostelos in Greek. You look a bit Greek, by the way. <laughs> so so I, I'm, I'm sure people have mentioned you may have got a Latin look to you. Okay, I mean, a, um, like a uh, like Mediterranean look. Anyway, so the point being is that he is the messenger sent by God. And that's what Islam, if you just move out of the way, brother, please, for a second. That you worship none than the one true God. So we have a, something called an Islamic testification which is analogous to John 17, 3. That there is no God worthy of worship except for the one true God, Allah, and the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, is God's final messenger. You see that analogy? So Christ, it's, 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 for Christ would have been the Shahada at his time, the testification there's only one God, Jesus is the messenger of God, at his time. And then when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, comes as the final messenger of God to mankind, saying the same message that they were all came with. We worship none of the one true God. And in last, I'll land my pain in 20, I know you're desperate to come in. No, no. Abraham, what religion would he have been when there was no Judaism and no Christianity? He would have been a Muslim. Because a Muslim by definition is one who does the will of God. So when Christ, I do not do my will, but the will of God have sent me. Hence, Abraham would have been a Muslim. Luke chapter 6 verse 40, in Aramaic the term Muslim is used, I'll just say 20 seconds. Yeah, yeah. 
No, that's it. So, you know, just to, just to wrap it up, I was explaining to you the five pillars of uh, Islam, the six pillars of faith, yeah? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, what do you reckon so far? You know what? Islam is exactly the same religion as Jesus, Moses, and every other prophet. You understand? That's what I'm saying. And we do not distinguish them from anything. We believe that they are all equal. But our Prophet Muhammad is the last and the final messenger. And we should all accept him as the final messenger. Is this something that. Um, let it live every. We're here every Saturday. Okay. If you want to come by, you're very welcome to. We can have further discussions. Yeah. One, more, one more last point. One more last point, and I land my pain in 30 seconds, Jonathan. This has been recorded. If you fancy watching it, you can watch it on three different YouTube channels. Okay. One is called Sam Dawa. D A W A H. Dawa to Soul. S F Dawa. S. And it's a, do you want to note it down? Maybe you can watch. They'll, they upload it very quickly. You'll probably be on the YouTube within a few hours, right? And you may have many thousands of views as well in mean, no time. Okay, so have a little read of it and then um, see what you think. Really enjoy speaking to you. Thank, thank you, you've been very good. Thank you. Hope you found it informative. Alhamdulillah. Good brother, you can make a. So, Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah. Why do we sometimes people might say, oh, you should give him Islam in the nutshell? The brother did initially. Why? Because he noticed his line of questioning. He was questioning about the crucifixion, then we gave him the verses from the Quran, then we showed the evidence, the internal um, anomalies within the gospel narratives of the crucifixion narrative, and by that methodology, it then resonates, then we hammer home the Quranic um, understanding. And hence, he was very much considered, I could see in his face, he was like considering this deeply. He seemed to know the Bible quite well for an atheist, although he said he went to um, Christian school um, in his youth. So hence, this is the conclusion that we all make that you know, Allah is one, people are beginning to realize this more and more. And this is the beauty of having these channels which can get the message out more and more. And obviously you need to share. When you see the video, share it with your contacts. So more and more people can watch and inshallah Islam can spread quickly. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.